Hi. This is uh, the Gilmore Gang, and uh, I'm Steve Gilmore, and we're coming to you from the new Gilmore Gang Studios, courtesy of Salesforce.com, and uh, most importantly, New Tech, who has uh, uh, given us uh, access to, I don't know if we can see this on the uh, uh, screen, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that yeah do a take tina rather than the soft dissolves thanks okay that's that studio yeah there it is this is huh. what it looks like it's Doesn't fantastic it and we have absolutely no way of knowing whether we're uh, actually doing anything right with it <laughs> um i do want to do one thing with scoville's uh why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Uh, let's start with uh, uh, with uh, Kevin Marks. Hi there. <laughs> Happy Saturday morning. I'm indoors today because my neighbors are cutting their hedges, so um, hopefully you'll be able to <clears throat> hear me properly. Keith? You know, I thought I heard Kevin say, I'm in Dorset today. And I was thinking, <laughs> how did he get to Dorset? <laughs> Probably most of our listeners don't even know where Dorset is. Anyway, I'm in. Uh, I'm at home in Palo Alto, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing Steve in beautiful high definition 1080i. Ah, uh, that famous ironic British wit. <laughs> okay, and uh, Robert Scoble, welcome. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Now talking to the mic. Hello. Okay. <laughs> By the no, way, it's, uh, it's good to be on a new uh, TriCaster. It sure we, is. We can it's see so the far it looks uh, a little shower. sharper. It's so okay. good I can tell Robert, you just you're, shower. I'm sorry, but I'm having a little trouble hearing Robert. Uh, what should I do for you? That, that helped. Okay. All right. And uh, our levels seem to be okay. Uh, or they're not. Uh <laughs> So uh, we can talk about the TriCaster at some point because it's really quite amazing what it does, and uh, we're we're just you, scratching the surface of it. You can put us into a virtual set now, right? So you could put us on the beach in Hawaii or whatever. Yeah, I'd rather just put myself on the beach in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll work on that. Uh, at some point, Tina, you do have to go to a double box so that we can make sure that it's actually working. Yeah, I'm just warning you. <laughs> okay. So who's going to the uh, Macintosh uh, 30th cel uh, anniversary celebration tonight? Uh, not me. Uh, it looks interesting. I'm gone, I think. I am not. I don't even know about it, I don't think. Oh. Uh. It's in, the, it's in the Flint Center. Cool. Yeah. I'm so going to it's Ross a little expensive. Mayfield's it's $140 for, uh, for a VIP uh, ticket. And uh, who's going to be there? I don't know. I, other than Mark Cantor, <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of journalists who are going. Let me, let me actually look through. Steve Levy's in interviewing the original Mac team, and it, it, it looked like an, quite an interesting lineup. Yeah. Um, Stephen Levy, John Markop, Dan Farber says he's going. John Scully says he's going. Um, John Furrier, Tom Fremsky, Fred Davis, who started Wired Magazine, um, Marlene uh, Delphis, who started, uh, I forget her company, she started in the 80s, but she's one of the first female executives in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, Tom Riley from TED, uh, Jan Ziff, um, Tim Barat Bajaran, who's uh, an analyst in the world. So a lot of a lot of VIPs should be good networking at least, and, and quite a lot of original Mac people as well. Yeah, I assume all the all the original Mac team will be there, or, or many of them. Um, What's but I've already name? talked with them. We we talked with them in line for the first iPhones. <laughs> uh, what was that guy that we talked to online? Uh, Bill Atkinson, right? Yeah, that yeah. was for the first iPhone. Yeah, no, Bob. Yeah, well, he wrote Quick Draw and Mac Paint, so he's 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 definitely one of the original team. 
But he's also one of the original team that continues to hang out, or at least did a couple of years ago at the the famous uh, Scoble Out the Door First with Dave Weiner uh, version of the iPhone. Was that the first iPhone, Robert? Uh, it was the first one sold in the uh, uh, Paul Alto store. So how many years ago was the iPhone? Seven years, I, th- uh, I think, if I remember right. Or six. Uh, six or was it seven years when they, it was 2007 when they did the first demo, but they didn't actually ship it till the summer. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a while ago. Exciting <laughs> times on the Gilmore Gang. Yeah, so what's <laughs> happening now that's exciting like that? According to you, Robert, nothing, right? Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I just got back from CES, and they had uh, there were several themes. Uh, home automation was a big deal, and obviously Nest got sold to Google for what three point two billion dollars. So that verifies that home automation uh, is a happening thing. Um, cars continue to get more connected and more contextual. Mercedes showed off a contextual car that knows where you're sitting and what your behaviors are and where you go and will um, pre-populate uh, the display with your favorite restaurants after it figures all that out, among other things. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, self-driving cars are still, you know, a decade to 15 years before normal people like me can afford them. Uh, and get them past the lawyers. Um, I talked with the guy who runs uh, BMW's autonomous car division, and he said it's 15 years away before the lawyers allow it. Um, but he says you'll see lots of little uh, steps. Uh, yeah, that, it's very incremental. The cars, the cars start warning you about things, and then gradually they, taking, they take more and more. Yeah, yeah they're, or even they're taking corrective you, action. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, even my Prius, right, it has lane keep assist, so it, it's watching the lane markers, it's watching the car in front of me. So if the guy st- is, you know, slams on his brakes in front of me, my car actually stops. Um, and those features have, have already started showing up, but we're going to continue getting more and more autonomous driving technology in our cars to make our lives safer uh, until we get a fully... He actually said autonomous driving is actually six steps uh, from everything from... A little bit of a warning system that something's in your lane, or or uh, that you should wake up and uh, pay attention to the road to uh, a full autonomous driving car where you don't need a driver at all. Um, and that's what what he says is 15 years away is is the full autonomous driving car. Um, uh, 3D sensors are continuing to be interesting. You know, uh, Prime Sense last year was a hundred dollars. Uh, this year, I saw a company. Uh, selling them for twenty dollars, so the cost curve continues to come down very rapidly, and that enables new things like uh, meta glasses uh, uh, that, that they're showing off that have a three D sensor that maps out your your world as you walk around. So something's happening there. It's just I I don't think we're gonna see a, a really good wearable glass computer this year, <laughs> and maybe not even next year. And it might be two, three, four, five years um, before we get one that the mass market really uh, says that's that's cool. Um, what else is happening? TVs are getting thinner and sharper. Uh, the OLED TVs were uh, um, not only uh, thin and sharp like they were last year, but now they're uh, bigger and cheaper and they're curved this year. So you get, um, you sit in your couch and you, it's more like a movie screen. Um, but, uh, you know, does that excite me? Nah, not the way the first iPhone did. I'm not standing in line for any of that stuff. You're getting old, Robert. That's what it is. I what? You're getting old. Um, no, part of it is, um, the mobile phone is so important to everybody. And... And we knew it was important before the iPhone came out. I, I mean, I had a, I have a drawer of old Nokia phones that I was doing live streaming with and trying to get on the web and trying to do a new kind of journalism with. But they were hard to use. And when the when the first iPhone came out, we knew that the world had changed or was going to change. Um, but you but you can't get too jaded. I mean, I I, I was doing yeah. see you see me between England and Australia in Siberia Cafe in August 1994 with text overlays on a video screen, no audio at that point. Um, 
and and you know so this thing's been going on for 20 something years but it's still exciting isn't it yeah it, it is it's just uh you don't see those major paradigm shifts all that often i think wearables are a paradigm shift but we haven't yet seen the one that really is going to sell tens of millions of units you know the fitbit yeah, you know, there's a lot of people who buy them, or the Pebble Watch, yeah, that's, but those are not going to be uh, worn by everybody in society like like we have with a smartphone now. And so... I, I just saw one by a company called Qantas, with two S's, that Vinod Kostler is invested in. I think it's still secret, so I better not say anything, but um, it's a wearable, yeah. and what the sensors are able to pick up from your body is eons beyond anything that Nike, Nike or anyone else has so far done. And, it, and, and the power, the Bluetooth power, means that it's not an issue anymore with low yeah. power Bluetooth. And the real timeness of the cloud knowing your vital signs, for example, is, is all taken care of. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. So I, I think things... The human life is going to be impacted by change dramatically over the next couple of years. Uh, that is absolutely true. And um, I know there's lots of sensors coming that are going to study whether you have cancer, whether you're having a heart attack and other things. Um, it's just uh, I don't know that it, it gets to mainstream adoption this year. I, I think there will be some exciting announcements. I, I assume Google and Apple are both coming into this world with uh, interesting products. Uh, that'll get our attention and be uh, fodder for future Gilmore gangs, but we haven't seen those yet. So the big, the biggest discussion that's going on, and obviously, you know, when Apple invented the iPhone, they invented a new paradigm, and we're still in the paradigm, and the paradigm works, which is why we're still in it. But uh, most of the discussion is about uh, the impact of that on the software we use, and there's a there's a you know this Princeton study that predicts the end of Facebook, and then Facebook's uh, counter to that came out yes yesterday, which was fairly hilarious. Yeah. And this morning, there's a Wall Street Journal article predicting that we're going to stop using Twitter, using the Justin Bieber imprisonment as the example of how Twitter has got the pro they 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 describe it as a problem of overcrowding that it's almost too successful, which means that the good stuff. Um, is so buried in noise that you don't really um, have the patience to find it anymore. They have not discovered the Discover tab, which is using filtering for the first time, and Twitter is investing now in, in filtering. Um, they realize that uh, that is a problem, and they need to find the straw in the box of straws to show to you what is cool uh, amongst the stuff that you followed. It, yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, I'm following 40,000 people, so I'm at the extreme end of that. Um, and most of the tweets that come through are noisy. Um, they're not stuff that you really need to care about. Um, but So you, you probably didn't even see my tweet this morning that I'm selling my $3,000 24 terabit RAID array, did you? No, I didn't. But <laughs> there I, you go. <laughs> I haven't been online yet. You know, I got up for and those came on the Gilmore check game. it out. <laughs> <laughs> so... Actually, you know, this is why I like uh, Flipboard. You know, why I like Flipboard and uh, Facebook better because I can see that kind of signal in in the noise better um, with these with with these other tools. Um, and uh, people are arguing about Facebook, but I, I, uh, you know, I think they're all wrong. And I'm happy that everybody's like, oh, I'm leaving Facebook. Blah blah blah. It just leaves uh, more space for people like me to build a brand. But there, there is uh, something interesting in what she says in this article. I think it's a woman uh, who wrote it. I can't remember the author's name. Um, yeah. There is something interesting, and I don't think anyone yet fully understands this, including probably us. But there's no question that young people are using new tools in preference to Facebook. Um, That's true. A lot of the time. And Snapchat's the one that gets talked about a lot, but I think Instagram is still growing. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, the WhatsApp guy was at DLD this week. They, they, they are growing like weeds. So there is something happening at the level of software and human use, which um, to me is all about platform fit. It's like, is Facebook really a platform fit for mobile? Not from Facebook's point of view, but from the user's point of view. 
or are there better platform fits for mobile? I, I, I think that's a different argument. I, I, you know, the, the teenagers are going to other platforms because there's social consequences of posting on Facebook. Um, you know, I, even for older people, there's consequences. You know, um, uh, if you if somebody says I'm I'm hurting or or my husband just had a heart attack and you don't respond properly, all of a sudden you have drama in your life because of how you did or didn't respond underneath a Facebook post. And when you have a media that disappears, like on Snapchat, a lot of those consequences go away because there is no way, way to go back and say you didn't respond appropriately because the whole thing's gone. <clears throat> and teenagers figure this out. And that's why that I, you know, talking to the teenagers, that's the reason they're not on Facebook. It's because they, they have deep knowledge of the social consequences of, of being there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, their parents are there, their teachers are there. I mean, I, I, um, you know, we, we had a discussion here with uh, one of um, Milan's teachers who's over the house all the time. He's not allowed to friend any of his uh, uh, kids' parents because uh, there's, there's consequences and there's rules now in a lot of companies and stuff like that. And and the kids figure this out and are and I have left be, for systems that don't have those social consequences. In in the um, UK, it's even worse because Twitter is considered um, a platform on which you can uh, be criminally criminally convicted. So, for example, um, racists were abusing a soccer player last week, and arrests were made. Yeah. And so there's no free speech in the UK on Twitter. Um, well, there, there's free speech, but you can't harass people. There's, you know, they, they've extended the, the, the harassment laws to, to Twitter, which is, um, that's something that is, you know, that's, that's defensible. That they, yeah, well, they, they've just convicted two people speech, of... Um, speech can be harassment. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a line there. Um, but, you know, there well, is a line there that, 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 that some people where's cross. that line? I mean, if I say, if I say someone sucks, yeah, that, that's free speech. If you say, I'm going to come to your house and kill and rape you, which is what they did, what the convictions were for, that's rather different. Yeah. I think there's convictions for a lot less than that as well. The line is pretty <clears throat> gray where that line is. And, and I think once you even accept that there is a line... This has you, been a problem. You really so, don't there, have there, 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 Since the very beginning, though, right? In my was, book, uh, Naked Conversations, eight years ago, we had a whole chapter on people who got fired with blogs, right? This has so, been a problem, and there are deep social consequences of being public. Um, and the kids know this, and there's additional drama in, in high school that, that adults generally don't have to deal with, you know, bullying and, and uh, you know, grouping and being left out of things. And, you know, hell, my son had a – his uh, guy friend's phone was stolen by his girlfriend – and the girlfriend started acting like him and, you know, and interrogating him and caused all sorts of drama, right? I generally don't have to deal with that as an adult. So they're really knowledgeable on the consequences of this world. They grew up in this world. And they, they pushed this world harder than anybody else did to the uh, consternation of parents who saw people doing sexting on Facebook and getting drunk on Facebook and all that. Now they've moved all that behavior over to, to Snapshot where the parents can't see it, the school can't see it, the law can't see it, and even other kids uh, can't see it because the message goes away after eight seconds, right? The, so the, the point in the Wall Street Journal article is that private uh, conversation, not just ephemeral, but, but private between you and people you know that it, the world can't look in on, is what's driving the trend. And I definitely... I you know, we I, launched I a chance. We we we, I, we pulled off. We pulled down the Just Me app and launched this new app called Chance by Just Stop Me, which is mm -hmm. uh, the button just says "Take a Chance" and you meet yeah. a random stranger and you chat with them. That thing has had 1.8 million messages in two weeks. Yeah, and it's random strangers in private. Yeah, I never would have guessed. I mean, it's totally not viral. There's no virality because you don't know anyone. Right. You can't share it in any way. No, but you can did, talk about it on Twitter, you know, did, and say they, this is the coolest persist? thing ever. Yeah, they come back. Did, I mean, uh, what, uh, they, basically, we don't, 
it's like the, walking into a bar and meeting a random stranger, and unless you exchange phone numbers, you'll never see each other again. So there's no, nothing in chance. There's no accounts. There's no profiles. The messages are not retained. No, that, that's the dating. images I, are not retained. It's completely ephemeral and anonymous and private. So it's, it's sort the of least dating, attractive from a virality point of view. That's sort of a dating behavior, and dating behaviors have been popular for a long, long time. I, my next door neighbor, eight, ten years ago, was worked at Yahoo and told me about the traffic that Yahoo had on its dating site. And today, you know, you talk about Tinder or in the gay community, Grinder or uh, any of these newer apps that allow this new kind of uh, high velocity meeting of people with very low consequences. That that totally makes sense to me, right? Yeah. So so effectively, you've 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 turned it into chat roulette, or it's chat that... ru it's chat roulette, but without the um, we've built in various blocking things. So if somebody blocks you three times, you, know, you the the app locks up for twenty four hours, and if it locks up three days in a row, it locks up forever. Gotcha. So so we kind of protect. So it's, got, so it's got so it's got like a, a, a extreme sanction that that gets rid of the, the the trolls quickly. Okay. Yeah, and we're about to launch a place called um, um, what's that place between uh, before hell, uh, beginning with P. Purgatory. Purgatory. We're going to introduce purgatory and then hell. Now <laughs> the interesting thing is we're going to let people in hell talk to other people in hell, but they won't <laughs> be able to talk to people on earth. You've got to be careful about that. You're then creating a place where they can conspire and then launch attacks with new accounts and things. True. I've been in hell uh, for years. <laughs> and uh, it's not as bad as people say. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. You're not. That, that's different. Different, <laughs> different relationship. Yeah. Cl I have, Clive I have said. several uh, marriages, you know. Hey. Yeah. Cl <laughs> Clive in the chat room says Facebook has overdone the social graph that has consequences that Zuck isn't dealing with. I think he has dealt with it. He's decided what Facebook is going to be, and it's not going to be Snapchat, and it's not going to be Instagram, and Facebook bought Instagram, so Facebook and Instagram are you know, the same company, so he doesn't care that the kids are going to Instagram at all. Um, I think the kids, when, when they get to a place where they need to get a job, or meet people in a public context, they're going to come rushing back to Facebook and Twitter um, if you do, if, or LinkedIn. If you don't have a public profile, you are not going to get hired in this new economy um, or you're going to get hired at a lower rate, right? Uh, every HR person at Rackspace uses Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, uh, Twitter to see what you are signaling to the world. And, and what kind of profile of work have you shared with the world? You know, if you're a coder and you don't have anything on, a, on a, you know, the, the crowdsourced GitHub. sites, GitHub, GitHub you're, you're not going to get a job at the same rate as somebody who has a beautiful profile of work there, right? And you're not going to get uh, hired at the same economic level as somebody who has been part of an open source community, right? But, yeah, but Robert, you must admit that there's a possibility that that is um, not going to be sustained. There's a possibility that the generation we're looking at now um, won't, won't, and it won't submit themselves to that kind of... Um, Absolutely uh, false. I, the kids all know this, that when they want a job, they have to put a profile of things out there to email around or share on social networks. Um, you today, know, to, today, today they it, do. This is going to be more true in the future than it is today. Well, I, I think that's possible. I think that's possible, but I think it's equally possible that it turns into its opposite, that kids basically contrive network-friendly profiles that are filtered from their true selves, and their true self is more and more submerged. Um, yeah, and the, there will be... Uh, I think there's a new digital divide coming. Uh, uh, people who are totally into these new... Tech, contextual technologies, I call them, uh, and people who are off the grid. Uh, you know, Richard Stallman, when I had dinner with him, was wearing a button so, that said, pay cash for everything, stay off the grid, don't give your personal information to anything, don't be on, you know, he's like, don't be on Facebook, don't be on Twitter, don't be anywhere, right? And that's the extreme point of view, and I'm way on the other extreme, which is use all this stuff, 
to have your life be better. You know, I use Uber and I give it my uh, my uh, credit card. And by the way, every time I ride in an Uber cab, I am being rated. Customers are being rated. If I barf in a cab or in a in a car and ruin the car, I get a one, and I'm not going to get picked up anymore by the Uber system because they know I'm a high, uh, low value customer. Right? There's a there's a great Seinfeld episode about that where Elaine has been black listed by the doctors and she has to go to find a new doctor and every doctor looks her up and figures out she's a difficult patient and, and everything in life is like this you want to sell a book on Amazon you better figure out how to get uh, reviews in fact right now we're trying to get reviews for our audible book because we have plenty of reviews on the Amazon side but the audible side doesn't bring the reviews over so you got to get more reviews there if you don't get reviews you don't get featured you don't get distribution when people actually find your book for, by accident and you have one review and the next book has 200 reviews they're gonna buy the 200 review book right what about um, goodreads how does goodreads work for you same thing you have to you have to if you're really gonna sell a book you have to be everywhere there is an audience and you have to have a lot of reviews <laughs> and so you have to figure that out and that's the same as an entrepreneur right you guys know this if you don't have any five-star reviews on on Apple people aren't gonna download your app they're gonna go man that's yeah. not that's not a cool app, right? But the, you know, there's big businesses being built, which are the modern equivalent of SEO businesses, yeah. which are just faking everything. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's fake a Twitter problem. followers, fake friends on Facebook. But, but even Yelp right now is uh, removing a lot of reviews it, it, because your reputation as a reviewer is not very high, and they, you know, if you only have one review and you review my restaurant. I, Yelp says, oh, that's a friend of yours. Yeah. Now, if you have five reviews of five different restaurants and then you review my restaurant, you get to stay there. So, um, yep. you know. Uh, Charles. You know, Slashdot figured this out a long time ago. Uh, everyone has karma, and you earn karma through what you do. Yeah. And uh, most of the readers of Slashdot, they give you a filter that says only see people with a karma score above X. Yeah, uh, and it filters everyone below that score. Which the downside of that is you don't see interesting new people, um, but you do get rid of all the, you know, rubbish. Yeah, it, it, filtering is a really interesting world. Well, you do and you don't. You you get you get a a, a, set, a sense of what the other readers of that site think. You 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 don't necessarily get rid of um, all the rubbish. You, you you any rubbish that sort of tickles their fancy will show up. This is the, you know, this yeah. is the hacker news problem. You know, back to the digital, the new digital divide, which isn't between rich and poor, it's between users of this stuff and non-users. You know, I was in a United Airlines in Chicago one night. I was in the plane. The plane was uh, leaving the, uh, the, uh, uh, the terminal, and my trip, it said, a uh, plane is being canceled. Here's uh, another flight out of town. I got one of three seats. Uh, two minutes later, the pilot comes on and says, sorry, our plane is being canceled due to mechanical tr troubles. And we're going back to the gate. And, uh, you know, there was 100 people who had to stay in Chicago that night. And I was not one of them. I won the game of life because I use this te the technology and I give my privacy away. Uh, TripIt has access to my Gmail. I mean, imagine 10 years ago you would say, you know, you're going to give access to all of these uh, apps into my, my Gmail, you know? Mm. Um, mm. And on and on, you know, um, tomorrow so, we're going so, to Tamarin a restaurant do, in Palo Alto, and they use OpenTable, and they tell the staff who is coming to dinner, and they, they, they uh, uh, pre-populate the menus in the restaurants based on that and everything else. They're a very high-service uh, uh, company. Well, you don't get that service if you don't use OpenTable, right? You, you know, you're just going to be treated like an average Joe. So I, I, th I think there's multiple things happening here. And Robert, you are definitely uh, focusing on real things that are really happening. But there's other things happening as well. And I think probably, and they, and they appear at first instance to be contradictory because there's a growth of private ephemeral communications on mobile. There's also a growth of um, open sharing of metadata regarding you. you. Um, and I think what's happening is um, people are becoming more sophisticated and they're dividing their attention between tools that support various outcomes that they want to achieve. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, yeah. and so I think that what's really happening is people are managing their public stuff more. Uh, I find myself doing that. Um, and they're communicating with uh, private tools when that's appropriate. Yeah. And, uh, and there are more tools that allow you to do that. And uh, I also think, you know, there are times when people want to be anonymous and there are times when people want to be who they really are. Um, and if you think of the grid that... See, I'm, uh, I'm who I am in public. So. <laughs> but a lot of people uh, are, you know, are not. Like, uh, I mean, if you think of Twitter and Instagram, in initially they allowed you to have a handle that disguised your true self. Now, over time, most of us put our real names in there and we re we're ourselves. But yeah. the beginning point, uh, anonymity was possible at least. Um, public anonymity. And uh, I think public anonymity, uh, private anonymity, public being yourself and private being yourself are four different boxes. And yeah. they eat, all four of those boxes are growing right now. Yeah. Um, there's yep. things in, in all four, and some apps manage to be in more than one. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's the, the one, you're saying that the people are stopping using Facebook. One thing that I'm finding I'm using more and more is Facebook Messenger because it's actually fairly well put together and, and runs on desktop and on phone and everyone seems to have it. So that I'm finding that's, that's more usable than text messaging is um, and you know, because text messaging is only on phones and it's tied to phone numbers. And I think one of the structural problems with some of these text messaging replacements is they have the same problem. That, that's one of the reasons I don't use, um, what's it, uh, WhatsApp is that it is phone number based, which is when I, when I had my phone stolen last week, Suddenly, anything that was phone number based stopped working, and that was that was a really interesting thing for me because all these other ones that I was had already had the habit of using were still there, but the people who were trying to contact me through text messaging were scuppered, and that's a um, that you know I've I'd already, I've already had this thing where you, you know when I go to the UK I put a different SIM in so suddenly anything phone number based stops working, so I'm used to that pattern of that happening, and I suspect we're going to see more of that over time as these identifiers that that, that bridge between the different domains um, start getting more useful. Did you notice that Facebook announced, uh, I don't think it was this week, it was the week before when we didn't have a show, but they announced um, that the Facebook home strategy of integrating everything into a single uh, desktop on mobile, that they're abandoning uh, the idea of an integrated whole, and what they're now committing to is lots of individual apps that address different needs, right. yeah, that uh, makes sense. which is an interesting you know, shift. Facebook, if it could take a... Uh uh, an Android point of view uh, could win, but they're never going to do that. They're always going to take a Facebook point of view, and they're going to try to shove Facebook at the front. Well, that that is not going to work, uh, and I think that's an admission of we're not going to be able to take over your phone and, and own you and put you in the locked box. You know, uh, Dave Weiner always called it putting you in the trunk. You know, <laughs> right? Well, most people the... most people figure that out that they're being put in the trunk and they don't like it. You know. Well, that was, I think, think the problem with Facebook Home was that um, it took over the notification system, but it wasn't good at other people's notifications, and so it, it exactly. basically it, it basically made made them much less useful. If yeah. they'd actually if they'd actually th you know if they'd actually be more um, mainstream users of Android, they'd have realized that and they'd have they'd have done a better job of it. And I think part of that that was I don't a, think it's about sorry. being a mainstream user of Android. I think it's. Uh, when you're a company employee, you, you you always come at the world from the company's point of that's view. That's true. Yeah, there, there's, there's, you know? there is that same blindness. There's the same problem at, Google had with at Microsoft. Plants, we call that yeah. strategy taxes. You know, you have to pay the strategy tax, and you always have to take the Microsoft point of view, which is why Microsoft infuriates so many of us because they don't take the uh, user point of view. They always take the Microsoft point of view. You know? Sure, but, but it no, I mean, it's, it's, means... it's another group thing problem. It's, 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 yeah. Microsoft has that. Ex you know, you hear this where they they make these public pronouncements. You're like, what? What are you talking about? Where they think the only way of interacting with the world is is through Office and Outlook, um, because that's the way that they live their lives. And you know, Google has a similar issue in that they think everyone is using their tools because that's how they live their lives. Yeah. So yeah. Um, well, and, and they have a real uh, strategy uh, to push us, you know, into, for instance, using Google Plus. And we we all know this. That we talk about it in the public all the sure. time. You know. We're no, being, but, it, but we're being pushed into the Google Plus world, uh, you know. But it's also another, you know, it's a pattern of, um, well, surely everyone commutes to work on on buses that have perfect Wi-Fi. So building tools that that work yeah. with intermittent connectivity isn't something we need to think about. You know, there, there's yeah. there's there's that kind of you know, problem too. 
Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Facebook is focused a lot on the growing uh, markets, i.e., the, the developing world. Yeah, and that that means that they have to sort of ignore people like me and not do a redesign and not really make it nice to use Facebook. And they're going after that that other market, and it's uh, it's frustrating at times. You know, where where the news feed is sort of broken here and there, and. Uh, the UI, I, my wife still doesn't have the new UI that they promised six months ago. You know, I have it and it's okay. Uh, it's better in a lot of ways, that, but they stopped working on it for a, a bunch of strategic reasons. One being mobile and two being the uh, emerging markets. But I, I think the reaction um, that has led them to do, want to do multiple apps is partly a reaction to the failure of home and the issues with it. But I think it's also a reaction to the failure to acquire Snapchat and the success of Snapchat, uh, and the success of Instagram as a standalone app since they acquired it, has opened their eyes to the fact that the personas of human beings aren't easily put into a single box. I think that, yeah. that, that's really what's happening. Mm. But I think it's, it's, it's also that, um, so, but, but possibly slightly more on iOS than on Android, but the, the switching app context is a sort of mental model switch. It's like I'm now in a, in a space where I'm doing this. I'm now in a space where I'm doing that. Yeah. Um, and that that's something people are comfortable with. It's like, oh, okay, I want to do this thing. I want, I want uh, have a separate piece for that. With the um, with Android, you know, I suppose the other reason I end up using Messenger, Facebook Messenger more is that is that the the way the faces pop up on Android is actually really useful, and they can do that across apps. Um, so you you know that that someone's ready to talk to you, and you've got a, a good notification of that because there's a little face sitting there, and that's that's a that's a handy thing. Yeah, and it's an interesting debate uh, that I have shifted my ground on over the last two years. I mean, when I first started yeah. doing mobile social stuff, I was all about integrating the different uh, needs of a human being into a single app that supported all of them. Right. And that kind of works for some people, but mostly people used it for one of the uses. Yeah. And I think I, the, uh, the I don't UIs know if this get is just a historical in fact, this thing. Is, if I had but, a knock against Facebook, the UI is too complex. They have, they have lists, and uh, the, the follower model has gotten so convoluted, you, you have to put people on lists to make the feed work properly. And the feed is getting complicated with all sorts of stuff that you don't know why it's there, and you don't know how to control it. Um, and, and figuring out the privacy model is really difficult for for even somebody like me who who lives on it all day long. Much less my dad. My dad doesn't know that there's a little globe underneath uh, each message, and he can change <laughs> the yes. privacy to be just for family or friends. He, he just he has no you know. There's a whole range of users who just don't know what the privacy model is, and so they only use it for a certain kind of thing. You know. Right, and I think that is understandable. But, you know, the, the big question is, will there be um, an exchange server outlook moment on mobile where probably either Google or Apple or both on their independent platforms figure out that 90% of the function can be at the OS level and make it all work, thus, you know, shrinking the ground for apps to, 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 to support those needs? Or will we be in a, you know, a thin OS, multi-app world in which Facebook and others will compete for your attention based on serving various needs. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I, think, I don't uh, think anyone what knows was the answer Stone's to that. new uh, new uh, question and answer app? Um, Jelly. Jelly, yeah. I already un uninstalled it because it just doesn't serve me. But it serves a lot of people. It was getting It's getting a lot of engagement and a lot of discussion. Um, you know, it's not for me, but it, it's for somebody. And you're going to see, I think, more and more of those kinds of apps come along uh, that that fit somebody's needs. Um, you know, not every everybody has to be me, I guess. <laughs> I noticed right, but, that uh, Greylock, Josh Ellman at Greylock, who has uh, heritage at Twitter and Facebook, invested in Jelly yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Because they watch the usage numbers. And if it's getting usage, they're in, you know. Um it still might not win long term, but um, you know they want to be in play for twenty different services and see which ones win long term. But short term, this one uh, it got attention. And um, Apple promoted it from day one as the best yeah. app. It's the number one app. Yep. 
And I think that goes. Is it an Apple, Apple only? Apple thing is right pretty um, media sensitive. No, it's it sensitive. It it's promotes Android. apps that get talked about on TechCrunch. I mean, that's really the key because the Apple yeah. review team that manages those sites is just looking at the attention an app gets uh, uh, and then reflecting that on, on, on the ranking list. Um, it's not purely driven by. Um, it's not purely driven by the download numbers. No, uh, I know the guy who built that team that decides on what's getting featured, um, and he he uh, had a whole list of um, things that would get an app uh, listed there. First of all, he would look at your icon. If you had a shitty icon, you were not going to get featured, no matter how good the app is. Apple <laughs> really wants beautiful icons on that featured screen, which is sort of funny. But it, if you're an entrepreneur. You better know that so you can invest enough in the icon to come up to a certain bar level, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then he would he looked at 300,000 apps himself, he said, um, and he gives you 30 seconds. And if your app is clean and has a, a clean use case and something he can figure out, you, you probably go to the next level. Um, he also is looking at uh, the, the uh, tech press, you know, the tech crunches and all that. Um, and watching for things that come up, but and he's also watching the the review numbers. Uh, you know, does a app get a million re downloads really quickly, and do they get five star reviews? That's a prob a pretty good chance you're going to get featured next week. You know, um, but it's really hard to do that. You know, how how many apps yeah. are are on the Apple App Store? A million, more than a million, right? Uh, how many get featured every week? Twenty, you know. We're, we're featured on the iPad store in social networking and have been for a while. And um, we have a bunch of one-star reviews because the old Just Me users uh, hated the fact that we closed it down. <laughs> so the, the new app is getting one-star reviews from the old app users who loved it. <laughs> and despite that, we're still featured. Um, so I weird say, weird you know, product loyalty there. <laughs> A lot of product loyalty, but no company loyalty. It's like, <laughs> I love your product, but you suck. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> um, and anyway, we're still featured, but the interesting thing is the consequences of being featured have been shrinking. I mean, it really does not drive that many downloads anymore to be featured. It, it really is important that an app is, has a natural growth outside of being featured on the App Store, because other, otherwise Apple won't be enough to make it happen for you, even in a good outcome where you are featured. Well, I think chasing after popularity is a waste of time. True. Well, uh, it's not it's like popularity. It's, it's, it's distribution. Get... Yeah, I, I think it's a waste of time. I think that people that uh, know what they're uh, uh, know what they're talking about will find an audience, and that audience is infinitely more interesting than a broad audience. Yeah. That's just yeah. me. No, I, even it, even getting featured on the Apple Store only will get you ten to twenty thousand downloads a day. That's hardly a, a mainstream broad audience, but it is an audience of people who really are hardcore about apps. You know, most of my friends don't try new apps. My 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 dad has never. I doubt he's ever downloaded an app. I, 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 that's actually wrong, but he it's really hard to get him to try a new app right and most people are like that they're not like me where i have 300 apps on my phone and i get 10 new ones a, a week you know and i keep up with everything going on, on twitter and t tech meme and facebook and uh, other places most people are not uh fanatical like that about trying new things most of what you've got to do steve when you have an app most of the external judges who judge you are looking for engagement and what they call cohort analysis, which is, you know, did did the people who joined last week uh, were they more engaged than the people who joined the week before due to some features you tweaked? So it's really all about um, it's almost like a little engine that is measuring the extent to which people are uh, attracted to your magnet and stick, and how often they come back, um, and you know. At the early stage of a company, that itself can be quite frustrating because you're still trying to figure out the big picture philosophical reasons why you're doing this app and you're trying to find its natural audience. And it isn't always appropriate to measure the current audience because you may not have found your audience yet. So, well, one I, of think, the I think Steve uh, Jobs uh, defined uh, this era by 
suggesting that it didn't matter what people thought they were doing. It was what he thought they should be doing. Correct. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's how I think as well. That's how I think. But that doesn't always work. As, and it didn't always work for I think Steve. it always works. You know, look at the things he did that didn't work. But it allowed him to say no real quick. That's yeah, the thing. I, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, how he drove his company. I'm talking about the, the, you know, the material, the thing that actually went out over, I mean, I hate to say it, but the Beatles, of course, defined this. Uh, they did not care. In fact, they cared incredibly about change. That was yeah. their defining mm. uh, methodology. Was, Every time you heard a new Beatles song, it was different than the one you heard before. That's right. Yeah. And, and the, that is the not one that you heard before songs. was number one, and the next one was number one. And on and on and on. And the reason right. for that was that their imperative was to uh, not listen to the audience, but listen to themselves. Yeah. And, right. and luckily, they were, luckily they were in the moment. I mean, Frank Zappa probably did the same thing, but his audience was much smaller. Yeah, but I mean, he was equally successful uh, uh, with his audience. Yeah. It's not, I, I, I mean, I, I just don't, I don't think that there's all that much... I mean, certainly there's economic value uh, t to uh, the popular mainstream approach, but what ends up happening is is that you get this uh, w what's going on in the in the film business, which is this blockbuster idiocy kind of uh, you know uh, animation movies that have no soul, and on the other extreme, you have these uh, films that have all soul and no uh, box office kind of interest. I mean, I you know, the Blues Brothers was a great film, in my opinion, because they took, at that time, it was $40 million was a lot of money, and they wrecked a whole number of cars in that abandoned mall that they tricked out as uh, a real mall for the thing. I mean, they drove, they just threw away millions of dollars on screen, and it was in intensely enjoyable mm. to watch it, it the this you can't do that uh you know you have to get to a point where the uh uh combination <coughs> of a maniacally stupid idea and a lot of money produces something that you would never see before that's well, what's interesting to me yeah, well, you, what you're really saying, I think, I'll, I'll put my own words in it. I don't know if you're saying this, but uh, the way I hear it, I believe in, and that is you've got to believe in something. And uh, you, you, that's the only important thing. And, and then you have to try to give form to what you believe in. And hopefully what you believe in has an audience, either a small or a big one, and uh, that the audience is sufficient to justify the effort and you know you can you get to keep doing what you love doing because of that and that's the only thing that matters that's I, right I, I, that's I, right. I think i think that's what it is but i don't and, think that it's I, I don't think that the uh, artist pardon the expression <clears throat> needs to uh, understand what he's doing or what he's feeling uh, it can be just plain stupid i mean look at monty python they you know they they just reveled in in making themselves laugh i mean when I worked with the fire sign, you could tell when the you know that thing happened where something came into the room, which was not any of the individuals, but the sort of hu sense of humor of the group would appear magically. And you know, I'm sure that's what happened with the Beatles. I'm sure that's what happened with the Stones at various points in time. Uh, I'm sure that happened with Dylan. Uh, Hendrix was all imagination. I mean, these artists, they came along because of the uh, intersection of technology, uh, you know, electric guitar, studios, recording. They came along at a moment where they could jump from one level to this uber level. And, you know, that's what's been happening in the technology business for a long time. Look at Netflix. I, I think it's still happening in music, by the way. I, I, I like Skrillex for the same reason. I, every song of his sounds different than the other ones. And you can tell there's a, a real creative process that is not based on, you know, trying to appease uh, yesterday's audience. Mm. You know? Look at Netflix. 
Yeah. Netflix is just continuing to hockey stick. And, you know, people can argue whether or not that's real revenue or, you know, what the fundamental impact is of HBO's, con- you know, lock on the entertainment industry. But, you know, they, they're they lapping HBO at this point. We have no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea who their competitors are going to be, but it's it's defining this next generation of uh, of media. It, it We're in a new world, and we don't even reala- realize it yet. Yeah. Our kids do, because they don't, uh, you know, they don't see the point or really a, ne- a necessity to switch over to the broadcast channels. They don't understand why we look at them. I, it, it, even adults, I, I, I'm uh, cutting back our Comcast to save money, you know, and uh, maybe even turning it off. We're getting very close to where I can turn it off at this point. And if I can turn it off, the kids certainly are not going to have, you know, cable. They're going to watch everything through through online media and there are already are i mean if you watch how yeah my kids never use cables yeah yeah what 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 stops you turning it off robert what what is Uh, this thing that keeps you in sports sports and some of the tv shows that are a little hard to find online but if i uh went to BitTorrent, i'm sure i could find this (laughs) so you know but sport their on demand strategy is very very smart Uh, you know and this you know tv to go strategy i think ultimately is going to hold a lot of the audience. I mean, I, I think you're thinking about it, but I don't think you'll actually pull the trigger on it. Um, I'm really close, actually. I, and, and but part this of is it like is the I, Android. I'm a, Do you I'm have also any making, iPhones? Did you have the new iPhone? I have a, I have all these phones. Okay, I, so, so X, which Samsung, one's the one where I don't see Google What's Glass What's in my pocket right head. now? Where's your Where's your Google Glass? You're it's not at even Google because they're giving me the new 2.0. Oh. I had to send back. So the interesting thing is um, Apple. Uh, it was they talked this week about there being a new Apple TV this quarter. Yeah, we uh, we've heard that rumor before. Not an actual TV, a new version of the box. Right. My we've guess is that that's going to do 4K. It's probably going to do 4K. But the real interesting thing with Apple over the last six months is by putting HBO. ESPN, uh, ABC, and Disney, and all those things onto the Apple TV using the TV everywhere approach where you've got to authenticate that you are a subscriber. I think that probably means Apple has given up on any attempt to do an end around or an over the top. They're now playing with cable rather than around cable. And um, that, if that's true, then no one else is going to do it. The only people who had a shot really are Apple. So I think we I'm, are. I'm not sure I understand. What is it that they? Uh, well, you, you know, there's two ways to get each HBO on your Apple TV now. The the first way is to go to the TV section of your Apple TV, look at HBO as a provider, and see what it is HBO put through the Apple TV channel. The second way is to launch the Apple the the HBO Go app on your Apple TV and get everything that HBO gives to its subscribers who can prove that they have a cable subscription. They're both simultaneously exist right now on Apple TV. The second is new. Um, HBO always had some shows that were available through the Apple TV TV shows section. But everything is available. Like I watched the third episode of Girls on my Apple TV last night through the HBO Go app. But that third episode of Girls is not available in the Apple TV, but the H- HBO Go app is not on Apple TV. It's on it is, the, yeah, it is. So they, it's on the that it's on the dashboard, yeah. The, and what the, was the, it before? How did you use it? Before that was there, you just go to the TV show section. You know, it says movies, TV, podcasts. You go to the TV show section, and some HBO programs were there. The ones that they chose to give to Apple as the over the top, where you didn't have to prove you're a subscriber. Okay. Um, oh. So, so the only way you get the new stuff is if you prove you're a subscriber on cable. Right. That's, and, and uh, that's every TV everywhere or whatever. It's everywhere. TV everywhere. And I think the fact that Apple has conceded that territory is huge uh, for cable. I don't understand if, why you say they've conceded the territory. Well, because they, they, they now are saying you've got to prove you're an HBO subscriber to watch Girls on Apple TV. You've got to prove you have a Comcast subscription or a Time Warner subscription or an ATTUVA subscription. 
uh, yeah, I where, understand the the TV everywhere uh, model. In fact, I think it's going to be dominant. I don't, yeah, I, we're but, not going to go it's, back. But for Apple, that's new. Apple previously didn't embrace TV everywhere. They were trying to get content into the Apple Store. Um, oh, okay. So you're this, saying that this is about competing with the Apple Store. Uh, I think they conceded that territory a long time ago. I don't think that they get a lot of revenue from it. I think they conceded it a long time ago, but it's massively accelerated now that they've embraced TV everywhere. That's new in right. the last six but months. I think what they're doing is, is that they're preparing for the... The only way that HBO is going to move over to uh, you know, digital, completely you know, direct, uh, is going to be when there's an app universe, in, an app store basically that's accessible via Apple TV directly. Right. And that's, I think that if they do a refresh, that's going to be the most important part of it, is, is that they're going to re start releasing apps directly for Apple TV. And, and in a way, they're already doing it, except right now they're choosing the apps. You can't add additional ones. Um, uh, but they are, these things are apps. Um, the next step, if, if but, uh, HBO... What I want to do is what I want to... You know, it, it's the same game. I just want to be able to push the button on the Apple TV, whether it's controlled by my, uh, you know, MacBook Air, you know, by this or whatever, uh, be able to push the button and have it download the app and I can play it on the thing. That's that's the deal. And well, they, the, they don't well, allow that yet, but I believe that they're about to. I think they're about to. There's one missing piece, and I don't know if they'll do this. I think they should do this, but I don't know if they will. And that is... You are not a subscriber to cable or satellite, and you do not get HBO that way, but you can pay to get HBO on your Apple TV. But uh, HBO is not going to do that. Why would they do that? This is the way. You well, know, well, the, the you reason they would do it. HBO in order for this to work. Uh, the reason they would do it is because let, I don't know how much HBO gets from Comcast per subscriber per month, but I think it's about $7. ESPN gets $7. I don't know what HBO gets. If Apple would give HBO more than $7 per month per subscriber, HBO would have every interest in not caring whether the subscriber was paying Apple or paying Comcast. That, that's true, except that the, uh, the reason that HBO has a hammer lock on the ability to not allow anything that's on HBO directly to be anywhere except through their, uh, you know, what, what's the show that we watched uh, recently? Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, exactly. You can't get that anywhere. You can't. Can you download it at the same time? Is it even released to? Uh, so you can get it on Apple. Download? You can get it on Blu-ray. And, right, Blu-ray. And, and you can now and, get and it's it. And series old. Yeah. And now you can get it on Apple TV using the HBO Go app. I understand on your Apple that. TV. But that's my my point is is that you can get it on the app, assuming that you have uh, HBO through the cable companies. Right, so HBO is checking that they're getting the seven bucks a month from you. Why would they care if you could just give it directly to them through the Apple TV interface? Well, because there are these things called uh, cable companies that are you know, pumping up HBO with a lot of money that they pay for that exclusive content that they are not gonna let it go. That's just, the key. That's right. That's, that's so, the key, so there's a way around that. Uh, no, there isn't a way around that. No, there the way is. around it is to pay them, and the way and Apple is going to move to a model where th the people that want to pay that ticket, which is basically anybody who wants to see HBO directly, they're going to go and they're going to put it on the Apple TV with a TV Everywhere license. Well, it, well there's another way to, that they're going to do that, I think. I, 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 I totally you. agree with you, but I'm talking about details now. Uh, did you see the story this week about Amazon talking to all the TV stations about uh, doing licensing their real-time content? I, I think what's going to happen is Amazon and Apple are effectively going to become the equivalent of a satellite or a cable TV distribution system. So they will be looked at by a channel just the same way a channel looks at Comcast or the same way a channel looks at Time Warner or DirecTV. And as long as HBO is getting paid and they're happy with the amount, 
Apple will, uh, you will not have to have a cable subscription or a satellite subscription because your subscription to Apple TV will be the equivalent of that. And, and, you, uh, and I bet you that that won't happen be, simply because uh, Apple is, among other things, you know, a, a co-owner essentially of ABC and they're not going to, ABC will not let that happen for the reason that they need to prop up. There are basically two assets that the uh, overall television market has. One is live sports, which is why Scoble is not jumping. Yep, agreed. Okay, uh, I mean, you know, maybe after the Super Bowl you'll go off the air, but you'll be yeah. back, I promise. And then there's the... Uh, but more, more sports are getting online. Uh, uh, the Olympics are going to be streamed largely online. Well, wait till, um, you, wait till you pick through that and try it. You know, that's NBC, which is Comcast. So we're right back. My to son it. has a baseball app on his iPad, and it's it's pretty good quality. He uses AirPlay to push it to a big screen, and uh, it's it it lets him see more baseball games than you can on uh, Comcast, right? Right. And and once you get used to that, you will pay extra if you can actually instead of pushing it from your iPad to the big screen over AirPlay, if you just go direct to Apple TV, that's. Yeah going to be how people use that stuff and it's yeah. going to take some time but it's not going to be this you know cable cutting fantasy that that you know people are always sort of chasing the tail of by the way twitter well, uh, i got a, a survey on twitter yesterday and it was all about tv and it had like a hundred questions of uh ha have you ever watched a tv show because of a tweet and so twitter is studying our behavior and trying to obviously doing some market research to come up with products that will uh, use the Twitter stream to bring us new kinds of TV experiences, I, and it does affect what kind of TV I watch. I, you know, I got into Breaking Bad because of all my friends talking about Breaking Bad, and said, "Oh my God, what, what a great show this was!" You know, and it, I finally started watching it about, about season three. You know. Um, and, and I do the same thing with uh, sports. If somebody says, "Oh my God, some, something's going on at the," Masters, I'll turn on the Masters, right? Um, otherwise, so I'm, I, I'm so probably I, not going to watch the Masters. I don't think it's about cable cutting. I think it's about people buying what they want to watch and not having to pay for stuff they don't want to watch. And it isn't necessarily the case that you have to cut cable to achieve that if cable evolves. Yeah. But, but I do think that Apple and Amazon are both going to become and prob uh, probably Netflix as well, but more Apple and Amazon with Netflix as a channel. Apple and Amazon are more like uh, cable networks. I, I think they're going to have uh, subscribers, just like cable networks do. They're going to build those subscribers, and those subscribers are going to pay for content. So the only real difference will be, can you just pay for the content you want to watch and not have to pay for content you don't want to watch? And, and, and I think that is coming, and how it exactly works out is all about the negotiations and the details. I don't know how long it will take either. But I definitely think that the demand for what people normally call a la carte programming is, is so strong that, it, that somebody will make a lot of money by making it available one way or another. Okay, well, we'll see, won't we? Yeah. Uh, my bet is that uh, uh, just like Microsoft has always failed to get into content, uh, that Apple uh, uh, and Amazon will fail to get into content. And it, I don't think that Apple will actually fail because I don't think they're going to try. I think that what they're going to do is to allow people to get hooked on TV everywhere directly over Apple TV, as you've already described. And at that point, there will be a deal made. This is an economic struggle that's underway where the content providers... If, who are the producers of Game of Thrones? Um, I've forgotten. Yeah, um, me too. But uh, well, it's a, some guy named Benioff. Some guy named Benioff, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when some guy named Benioff's involved... A relation. <laughs> it usually means that it's going to get bigger than people thought. Probably why it's so weird. <laughs> I don't know. Hi, Mark, I don't was. know this guy. He's, he'll be off the show in a meet. I mean, weird in a good way. Yeah, but my point is, is that those people. I mean, obviously, HBO lo has locked up forever the Game of Thrones IP. 
I mean, they they bought it, they sold it. You know, there's the United Artists model of the uh, artists gaining control of the distribution is another fantasy that will never happen. But what will well, happen? I mean, that, look what happened to Coppola. He, you know, he ended up doing that uh, Vegas movie in a in a studio and. You know, he could have spent. He could have just built the actual Vegas with the budget of that film. Well, I, you know, I don't. I don't know if that's true or not true, but I hope it isn't true because I. I think that, you know, the the copyright laws and the relationships between uh, producers, as in the people who put the money in, and uh, content creators, is really. I was going to say 19th century, but it's probably more like 15th century. Um, it, it's it's been around for a long, long time, and that's largely because the capital required to distribute a, a creative product and even to make it was um, too much to be doable by anyone other than a large conglomerate that was aggregating stuff. And it is true that the role of the middleman is shrinking due to technology and you can envisage an endpoint where it shrinks roughly to zero and the book writer produces the book for the readers and the movie creator for the movie viewers like on Vimeo today. There's no middleman on Vimeo and there's some excellent content there and what would it take for one of those things to break out and become big? I'm not sure. A little bit of crowdfunding. Uh, it, uh, but many of the pieces are in place that that end result is not impossible to imagine. And if it were to happen, then a creator, uh, the director, the, the, the cast, the cameraman, and so on, don't necessarily need um, a Sony Pictures in the middle between them and their audience. Uh, I understand the theory. I just don't believe that it, it actually happens in real, in real world. I mean, the Beatles were, uh, uh, they broke out as far from uh, their expectations as, as humanly possible, yet they still, uh, you know, Paul McCartney uh, has been desperately trying to uh, steal his uh, publishing back from Michael Jackson uh, from beyond the grave. I mean, you know, these people, uh, they make deals at the beginning when people don't have economic power, and then later on, the, it's a race to see whether or not they can... Uh, regain their own her heritage. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and the bottom line is that by the time those people are able to do that, they've become the very studios that they have been trying to replace. Yep. It's a little known fact. You don't know this about me, Steve, but I actually wrote the Warner Brothers A&R database in, in the mid-1980s. Um, and in order to write that database, I had to understand the music business and how A and R works. And A and R basically is you you know you give a band two hundred thousand pounds. They spend it back with you using uh, resources you make available to them, like recording studios and sound engineers and such. And by the time they produced a record, which in those days was usually an album, um, they owe you two hundred thousand pounds. Uh, or more and then you pay for them to go on the road if they're moderately successful and by the time they have a hit they are massively in debt to the music studio who have paid this a and money up front about 90 percent of that a and money gets written off because the band flops and about 10 percent you get some winners who more than pay back for all the losses so it's a little bit like venture capital yeah not a little a lot like venture capital yeah so um so speaking that, that, of which, I just want to, uh, before we forget and before we run out of time, which this is already the longest Gilmore Gang in history, uh, <laughs> which, and what did we talk about? I don't remember. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it's just such so at least a, that's still the same. <laughs> it's so amazing that we've actually been able to do this. Uh, you have no idea how, how long <laughs> Tina and I have been in the weeds here. So uh, it's thrilling. But uh, I, had some idea yesterday, I do yeah. want to mention Ouch. that there was a very uh, interesting uh, and I think significant announcement, and it does relate to the idea of what we were just talking about, uh, the relationship with venture capital, which is that Benedict Evans, who I've been uh, 
uh, enraptured with uh, with his show with another Baharin who I've never gotten the answer as to whether or not he's related to Tim Baharin who uh, uh, I think Kevin mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, but Robert didn't think. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, but Benedict Evans uh, has, he's a, an analyst in the mobile space who has a, a great podcast with Ben Baharin uh, that I've been listening to uh, religiously. And uh, he just uh, was acquired, if you will, uh, with the record company analogy, by uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Yep. And uh, I understand he's actually moving to this country and to the Valley. Valley. Yep. So uh, the intersection of VC and analysts and, uh, you know, who, in my opinion, are the thought leaders of... Uh, uh, of the new media, not the press, um, which is why my day job at Salesforce is working with these people. Uh, this is an enormously important move because regardless of how fast he rises, which I predict will be extremely fast, uh, we're starting to see the, uh, the people like Scoble with expertise uh, <coughs> being able to cash in on, uh, you know, uh, jobs and uh, roles that allow them to actually get into the business of making the stuff that they've been analyzing and reporting on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge shift, and I think it ties in with what you're talking about, uh, Keith, when you're talking about this, uh, you know, what the actual bets are that are being placed and how money is being uh, moved around to create value, which then uh, allows this uh, tectonic shift in terms of the way that we can consume media. So I, I uh, congratulations to Benedict, and uh, we've talked about him coming on the, on the gang at some point, so uh, that may well... Uh, accelerate this con uh, conversation. So uh, let's go around the table uh, just real quick and uh, and roll up the uh, the first Gilmore Gang HD show. Uh, let's hmm. start with Kevin Marks. So my, my worry is the problem with HD is that I'm need to, um, gonna groom myself much more carefully for this show. So yesterday people see I hadn't shaved and that, that's really troubling. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a price to be paid for this extra quality. That's your summary? Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Uh, Keith. The world is changing, but not in ways we yet understand. By the way, I cut myself shaving. Oh, my finger's in the wrong place. And you can see that in HD as well. <laughs> Robert Scoble. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight and hanging out with all the um, Mac fans. And uh, celebrating 30 years of uh, an incredible ride. Um, sometimes I left it to go to Windows, and some now I'm back. <laughs> so you n you never left. No, Windows. <laughs> the 90s were a rough time for the Mac. Uh, I I still remember giving uh, people hell because uh, OS 9 kept crashing every hour <laughs> on their on their machines, and Windows NT actually was pretty damn stable back then. Um, but now it's the uh, tables are turned. I, I like the Mac better than the, the than the Windows system. Um, I have to but, say, just parenthetically, uh, the Tricaster uh, is built on top of Windows Seven, so I've actually been using it a fair amount. It's really spectacular. Yeah. Now that's Windows Seven, of course, not eight. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Windows Eight is actually pretty good. It's just. Um, you know they're chasing the the uh, OS. Uh, they're chasing the uh, the the phone that really they got their ass kicked, and uh, they're having some success in uh, the developing world, but not in the United States. I still don't. Uh, you know, I I keep track of what what do I see on planes. I still don't see Windows phones on planes in America. The numbers that they reported seem to be, uh, uh, you know, they're strong on uh, Xbox, but they're not making much money. Uh, and uh, and Surface seems to be doing better. Yeah. 
Which makes sense. The uh, you know, if you're gonna run um, old style Windows apps, i.e., Excel or you know, uh, Adobe Illustrator or something like that, uh, you know, the the Surface Pro is actually a pretty good machine. It's a, a fairly reasonably cost machine, and it's it's uh, you know the ones I've played with are actually pretty nice. So I I understand why they're selling. All right. They're still not selling it. Uh, you know, they're they're not uh, curing Microsoft's phone problem and tablet pro and new style tablet problem, which Do is. Do you have a service, Robert? I don't, because um, I exactly. I'm in the new world. I I don't use any of the old apps that I used to use when I worked at Microsoft. I don't use Exchange. I don't use SharePoint. I don't use, even though our you know at Rackspace we have million multi million dollar businesses on all that. Um, so I know there's a lot of people who who use them. It's just I'm in the new world, and the new world is different than that. Okay. I want to thank uh, Rackspace, who used to sponsor the show, and uh, particularly Rob LeJess, who will always be uh, the reason that the show got to, to where we are today and will continue that way. Uh, I want to thank uh, Salesforce uh, for... Uh, uh, helping us to be able to put the studio on the air. I want to thank uh, New Tech and their incredible TriCaster, and we'll talk more and more and more about this until your ears and eyes bleed. But this thing, uh, it's just been a struggle to get back to something that is remotely close uh, to what we used to do. Uh, so we're just, we're not even touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of its capabilities and I think that it's I had an interesting conversation with Mike Arrington the other day about how we might be able to have some sort of Charlie Rose type conversations with him uh, to sort of uh, uh, you know not in the traditional Gilmore Gang format but more of something that will be an extension to that. We're also working with uh, John Borthwick and uh, some of his companies uh, to develop uh, uh, a Gilmore Gang app, uh, or one that the Gilmore Gang will appear on, uh, which will open us to the world of uh, push notifications, which I've been on about for a long time, and as with uh, Benedict Evans, would like to actually be able to do what I'm interested in, instead of just talking about it. So uh, these things are all coming in the near future, I hope, and we thank all of those companies, including Rackspace, uh, for their support. Uh, I want to thank uh, our uh, producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore, who instead of the hand, can now cut to herself and do the hand. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin Marks. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. No, it's nice to see you. Likewise. And hear you. Um, I want to thank uh, Keith Tier. God, <laughs> this growing old is not fun. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, the names uh, go first. The names go first. I I never remember names uh, anymore. But thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, I want to thank, uh, of course, the irrepressible Robert Scoble. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, looking good, man. It's getting there, isn't it? Yeah. And I want to thank the folks in the chat room uh, for uh, finding us on an early Saturday morning. Uh, we should return to a reasonable schedule uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. What's the matter? You hate that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs>